Section 16 of Favorite Fairy Tales Retold. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Favorite Fairy Tales Retold by Julia Darrow Cowles. The Goose Girl by Grimm. Once upon a time there was a princess who had been promised in marriage to the prince of a faraway country. As the time for the wedding drew near, the queen prepared beautiful dresses and rich embroideries and costly ornaments of gold and silver and all the finery that a young girl loves to wear. I want the prince to be proud of his bride, said the queen, as she tried the dresses and ornaments upon the princess and the princess smiled happily as she thought of the wedding. Now the wedding was not to take place at the castle of her father, but at the home of the prince in the faraway country. It was a long journey, but the king chose his most trusty horse, Falada, to carry the princess to her new home, and the queen chose the most beautiful maid in all the king's household to accompany the princess, and the maid too was given a fine horse, from the king's stables to ride. Now Falada, the horse which was to carry the princess, could talk, but only the king knew this. Just before they started, the queen handed a small packet to the princess, saying, Keep this with you. It contains a lock of my hair, and it will act as a charm. When you are in trouble, it will help you. So the princess thanked her mother with tears in her eyes, and she said, Farewell to the king and all the household, and set off upon her journey. But the maid whom the queen had chosen was envious of the princess, and as they rode on she kept thinking, Why should the princess have the best of everything? The queen chose me because of my beauty. Perhaps I can find a way to win the prince for myself. Presently they came to a stream of clear water, and the princess said to the maid, Bring me a cup of water to drink. I am thirsty from the dust of the way. She drew from her bodice a golden cup which the queen had given her, but the maid replied insolently, If you wish a drink, get it for yourself. Why should I wait upon you? Now the princess was very young, and she knew not what to do, but her thirst was so great that she slipped from off her horse and knelt beside the stream to drink. And as she stooped, the packet which the queen had given her slipped from her bodice into the stream. The princess's eyes were so blinded with tears that she did not see it, but her maid saw it and was glad. Now she is no longer protected by her charm. I can do what I will, she said to herself. As the princess rose to remount Falada, she was astonished to see her maid upon Falada's back. Give me your veil and your embroidered gown, said the maid, and put on my coarse dress in their place. I shall present myself as the bride, and if you dare to contradict me, I shall have you thrown into a dungeon. The poor princess could do nothing but weep, and she mounted the horse which had been given her maid, and followed sorrowfully on till they came to the castle. There the maid presented herself as the true princess, and asked that some work be given the young maid she had brought with her as a companion. So the true princess was sent into the field to help the goose-boy tend the geese, while the maid was led into the castle where there was great rejoicing and feasting. For several days the feasting continued, and each day the true princess went into the fields with Curdkin, the goose-boy, to tend the geese. On the way to the fields they had to pass the stables where the king's horses were kept, and each time they passed the princess cried out, Oh, Falada, Falada, what would my mother say? And a voice from the stables answered, Oh, princess, princess, with the geese you shall not stay. Then the princess would go on somewhat comforted, while Curdkin wondered but said nothing at all. Out in the fields the princess let down her beautiful hair, which was all of pure gold that she might dress it. When Curdkin saw this he said, Oh, let me cut off a lock, it is all of shining gold. And he stretched out his hand to grasp it. But the princess called out, Breeze, blowed Curdkin's hat away. 
and hardly had she spoken when Kirtkin's hat was lifted from his head and carried quite outside the field. When he had caught his hat and come back, the princess's hair was all dressed and coiled softly about her head, where it shone like a golden crown. Every day the princess called to Falada, Oh, Falada, Falada, what would my mother say? And the voice from the stables answered, O oh, princess, princess, with the geese you shall not stay. And every day the princess let down her shining golden hair, and when Kurdkin would snatch a bit of its gold, she cried, Breeze, blow Kurdkin's hat away. And immediately Kurdkin's hat would fly quite out of the field. And every day the feasting and rejoicing continued in the castle. Now the king of the faraway country was very fond of horses, and one morning as he went through his stables he stopped before Falada's stall and exclaimed, What a magnificent horse! It is the one which the princess rode. No sooner had he said this than Falada answered him, The princess true is with the geese, the princess false is at the feast. The king stood still in astonishment. What is this I hear? he cried. The princess true is with the geese. The princess false is at the feast, repeated Falada. As the king hurried from the stables, he almost tripped over Kurdkin. Your majesty, said Kurdkin, I cannot have the strange maid with me longer. And he was all a-tremble with fright. Then he told the king how the goose girl spoke as she passed the stable, and of the voice that answered. And he told the king of the goose girl's golden hair and of how the breeze obeyed her. When he had finished, the king himself was all a-tremble with amazement, and he went straight to the field where the princess was tending the geese. At first she was afraid to tell him her story, because her maid had said she should be thrown into a dungeon. But the king told her not to fear. Only tell me the truth, he said, and I will protect you. I am the king. Then she told him all, and it was just as Falada had spoken. So the king took her by the hand and hurried to the castle and he had her dressed in beautiful garments and led her to the prince. The bishop was about to marry the prince to the false princess, but when she saw the king leading the true princess into the room, dressed all in beautiful garments, she fled from the castle and no one ever saw her again. So the prince was married to the true princess, and they lived happily ever after. End of section 16section 17 of favorite fairy tales retold this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org favorite fairy tales retold by julia darrow calves section 17 the spring in the valley an irish folk tale on a large island in the midst of a great sea there is a beautiful lake whose waters shine clear as crystal on a quiet night if your eyes are bright enough you may look down down through the water to its deepest depth and there behold a wonderful sight you will see a great stone palace with turrets and arches and gardens with flowers and shrubs and trees you will see a high round wall with an opening like a door, and a solitary man, with a crown upon his head, who seems always to be searching, searching. Now you should notice this wall and its opening most particularly, for without it there would be no story for me to tell. Once, long years ago, where the lake now lies, there was just a quiet green valley and bubbling up from the midst of the valley there was a spring of cool crystal clear water all the people of the valley used the water they used it to make broth for the babies and porridge for the old men and women they used it to cool the fevered brows and parched lips of those who were sick travelers drank of it and blessed heaven for water now there was a king living in the valley and the spring was close beside his palace gates. And as the king saw the great numbers of people going day after day to the spring for water, he said to himself, This will never do. There is no such water as this in all the world, 
yet every peasant drinks of it as freely as the king surely this should not be so he determined to build a high wall about the spring and to make a door in the wall and when it was finished he locked the door with a golden key now said he i the king have control of the waters and this is as it should be no one can draw unless they use my golden key now the king had one daughter and he declared only my daughter shall be allowed to bring water from the spring and to use the golden key the people began to cry and to beg for water but the king shut himself away and would not hear them then he thought within himself i will give a great banquet every one in the valley shall be made welcome rich and poor alike and at the banquet i will give them as much of the spring water as they wish to drink then they will be grateful so the banquet was announced and the king's couriers rode forth and bade all the people come when the time arrived the king's banqueting halls were thronged all the people of the valley were there and besides there came from a neighboring country a young nobleman of such grace and manly bearing that the king made him most welcome and the young nobleman danced long with the king's daughter and sat beside her at the banquet there was one other stranger at the feast an old woman whom no one knew but as all who presented themselves were made welcome no one asked whence she came now as they all feasted the young nobleman said to the king i have heard much of the water of your spring i should like to taste it this was just what the king had waited for and now he ordered his daughter to bring water in plenty for all the people to drink but his daughter did not like to carry the water for she thought it a task which the servants should perform then the young nobleman at her side said i will gladly go and help you as they passed out the door of the banqueting hall the old woman whom no one knew accosted the king's daughter she held forth a metal vessel beautifully wrought and set with great glittering jewels and as she did so she said i have brought this as a gift to you it is a magic vessel for carrying water when it is full the water will continue to flow from it so that you need fill it but once and all the people will be supplied oh thank you cried the king's daughter taking the beautiful vessel in her hands and hastening to the spring she turned the golden key and the young nobleman pushed open the door then she knelt to fill the vessel but as she did so it slipped from her hands and fell into the spring immediately the water gushed forth in a mighty stream it filled the wall it rushed through the door and poured itself forth into the valley the young nobleman grasped the hand of the king's daughter and together they ran to the palace but the water reached there as soon as they run run for your lives they cried the water is filling the valley then all the people sprang to their feet but above the confusion and noise the voice of the strange woman was heard as she cried now shall the people have water in abundance and it shall not cease to flow till the magic vessel which i gave to the king's daughter is found and removed from the spring then all the people ran and reached places of safety all but the king who stayed behind to search for the magic vessel the water continued to flow till it filled all the valley and became a great lake as it is to this day and the people built their homes about the lake where they had water in abundance and thanked heaven for it the young nobleman married the king's daughter and took her away to his own country the king who stayed behind was overtaken but he was not drowned instead he was condemned to live beneath the water which he had wanted only for himself and there he continues to search for the magic vessel but he never has found it to this day. End of section 17. Section 18 of Favorite Fairy Tales Retold. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Favorite Fairy Tales Retold by julia darrow cowles the magic snuff-box a folk tale once upon a time there was a poor young man who started out to seek his fortune 
he travelled many many miles and nothing would ever happen there is no luck in this he said to himself i hope my fortunes will soon mend even as he spoke his foot struck something hard in the path it sounded like metal he brushed aside the forest leaves and brought to view something white and shining picking up the object he examined it and to his surprise found it to be a silver snuff-box some fine gentleman must have dropped it he thought for the box was set with brilliant jewels he opened it and as he did so the box said ask me and i will help you the young man was so astonished that he almost dropped the box and quite too frightened to do anything but snapped the lid quickly shut but he put the box safely away in his pocket and travelled on toward night he came in sight of a great stone castle such as he had never seen before he walked all around it wondering at its size and its magnificence as he reached the front gates there came out a man wearing beautiful garments and with a crown upon his head so the young man knew that he was a king and that this must be a king's castle the young man lay down that night in the woods opposite the castle to sleep and while he slept he dreamed he dreamed that he was the owner of a castle even grander than that of the king and his castle stood so close to the castle of the king that the king was envious of him he wakened from his dream it was still dark he turned over and as he did so he felt the silver snuff-box in his pocket then he remembered that the snuff-box had said ask me and i will help you and he thought why not try it so he took the snuff-box from his pocket and opened it ask me and i will help you it said as before well then said the youth i ask for a castle finer and larger than that of the king i want it to sparkle with gold and jewels can you help me to that he had scarcely finished speaking when a most magnificent building rose as if by magic from the ground and in the morning when the king saw it he was too greatly astonished for words for his own castle looked quite mean beside it he hastened to the golden castle and when he saw its owner he said young man i will give you my daughter in marriage if we may all come to your castle to live and so the young man said let me see your daughter first so the king returned and brought his daughter the princess and she was so modest and so beautiful that the young man fell in love with her at once and he was glad to do as the king wished so the young man and the princess were married and they had everything they could desire and the king and queen came to live with them in the golden castle but the queen was jealous and envious and when she learned about the magic snuff-box she could not rest day or night for thinking how she could get possession of it at last she bribed one of the servants to find out where the young man who was now a prince kept the box at night then she bribed another servant to get the box and bring it to her as soon as she had the box in her hands she opened it and it said ask me and i will help you then the queen said i want this golden castle set down far across the sea where the king and i may live in it and have it for our own and almost as soon as she had spoken it was done but the prince and the princess with their children were left behind and had only the stone castle to live in and as the magic snuff-box was gone they became very poor because the prince could no longer have things for the asking then one day the prince said to the princess his wife i will set forth and seek my golden castle and my magic snuff-box of silver and jewels so bidding the princess and his children a sorrowful farewell he journeyed forth he travelled a long long distance and at last he came to the house of the moon he told his story and when he had finished he asked o moon in your travels over land and sea have your rays shone upon my castle of gold with its jewelled casements and the moon replied no my son no such castle have i seen but go to the sun his rays shine farther and more brightly than mine perhaps he has seen it so the prince journeyed on again for a long long distance till at last he came to the house of the sun he told his story and when he had finished he asked o sun in your travels over land and sea have your rays shone upon my castle of gold with its jewelled casements and the sun replied no my son 
no such castle have i seen but go to the wind he penetrates where my rays cannot go perhaps he has seen it so the prince journeyed on again for a long long distance and at last he came to the house of the wind he told his story and when he had finished he asked o oh, wind in your journeys over land and sea have you searched out my castle of gold with its jewelled casements and the wind answered yes my son such a castle have i found it is far away over the water but come with me and you shall soon reach it with that he picked up the young prince and carried him more swiftly than thought across the great sea and set him down in a woods and there close at hand he beheld his golden castle that night he hid himself in the woods till all the castle lights were out and then he let himself in with the golden key which he had carried all these years since his castle was stolen away and he crept up to the king's bedchamber and found the magic snuff-box he quickly opened the lid and at once the box said ask me and i will help you at that the king and queen wakened and they called out who is here help help but the prince was too quick for them before the courtiers and the ladies-in-waiting and the soldiers could reach the chamber he cried take me with my golden castle back to my wife and children but leave the king and queen here in this land beyond the sea and it was done the king and queen found themselves left without a roof over their heads but the prince with his golden castle and his magic snuff-box was back in his own land with his wife and children and they were happy all the rest of their days End of section 18. Section 19 of Favourite Fairy Tales Retold. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jessica Allen. Favourite Fairy Tales Retold by Julia Darrow Cowles. Old Mother Holler. From Grimm once long ago there were two sisters who lived together with their mother who was a widow now as sometimes happens the two sisters were not a bit alike one had bright hair and a fair skin and she was as sweet and sunny in character as she was good to look upon the other sister was dark and ill-favoured while in character she was sullen and selfish but strange as it may seem the mother cared more for the dark sister whose name was ellen than she did for esther the fair-haired daughter she not only gave Ellen better food and better clothes, but Ellen's tasks were always light, while Esther worked hard from dawn till dark. When the other tasks were finished, Esther was set to spin, and as she loved the birds and the flowers and the grass, she took her spindle and sat down beside the well. She called to the birds, and they came and sang to her as she worked, and she tried to forget the harsh treatment and the unkind words of her mother and sister. But now and then her eyes would fill with tears, and so it happened one day that as she worked she pricked her finger so badly that the blood came and stained her spindle. "'What shall I do?' she cried in alarm. "'If my mother sees my spindle so stained, I know not what she will do to me.' So she leaned far over the edge of the well, hoping to reach the water and wash her spindle, but instead it slipped from her hand and dropped to the bottom of the well." With a cry, Esther leaned forward to catch it, but by this she lost her balance, and she too fell into the well. But then something very wonderful happened. Instead of finding herself in a wet, disagreeable place, she was in a green meadow where flowers were blooming, and the air was soft and sweet. She walked along a little path which lay before her, and presently she saw beside the path a great oven built of bricks, and inside the oven were many, many loaves of bread. "'Take us out! Take us out!' the loaves called to Esther. "'We are baked just enough! Oh, do take us out!' So Esther stopped and took all the loaves of bread from the oven, and then she went on down the winding path. After a while she came to an apple tree loaded down with ripe, rosy-cheeked apples. "'Shake me! Shake me!' cried the tree to Esther. "'My apples are ripe! Do shake them down!' So Esther stopped and shook the tree till all the ripe apples lay on the ground and then she went on down the winding path. In a little while she came to a cottage, and there sat an old lady in the doorway. "'I have watched you as you came down the winding path,' said the old lady, whose name was Mother Holler, 
and I would like you for a maid. I know you are willing, and I am sure you are neat, and that is all I require. Esther saw that Mother Holler looked kind and pleasant, so she was very glad to stop a while. Every morning Esther shook old Mother Holler's feather bed, and then the people cried, Oh, see, the snow is falling! And Mother Holler gave Esther good food and the kindest treatment. But after a time Esther said, Mother Holler, you have been good to me, and I have been happy here, but I must go home to my mother and sister. Then Mother Holler said, It is right that you should go. Come, I will show you the way, for you have been a good girl. Then she led her out through a door, and as Esther passed through it, a whole shower of gold fell upon her, so that her apron and all her pockets were filled quite full. Then Mother Holler pointed the way, and Esther ran home to her mother and sister, and when she showed them all the gold that she had brought, they treated her quite kindly. The very next day, Ellen said that she too was going to find Mother Holler, for she wanted an apron full of gold. So she dropped her spindle into the well, and then she jumped in after it. And it happened to her as it had to Esther, for she found herself in a beautiful green meadow, and before her was the winding path. She had not gone far when she came to the great oven built of bricks, and full of newly made bread. "'Take us out! Take us out!' cried the loaves. "'We are baked just right! Oh, do take us out!' "'Why should I?' answered Ellen. "'I do not want to dirty my hands with your oven.' and she ran on down the winding path. After a while she came to the apple tree, all loaded down with ripe, rosy-cheeked apples. Shake me, shake me, cried the tree to Ellen. My apples are ripe. Do shake them down. Why should I, answered Ellen. Your bark is rough. It would hurt my hands. Then she ran on down the winding path. In a little while she came to the cottage, and Mother Holler was sitting in the doorway. "'I have come to be your maid,' Ellen said, without waiting for Mother Holler to ask her. "'Very well,' said Mother Holler. "'But you must be willing and neat, and shake my feather bed every day.' Ellen promised, and the first day she did very well. She shook the feather bed, and the people cried, "'Oh, see, the snow is falling!' The second day she only turned the feather bed over, and the third day she did not think of it at all. "'You are a lazy girl,' said Mother Holler and I cannot keep you for my maid. Ellen was secretly glad, but she only said, Then I must go home to my mother. Will you show me the way? Yes, answered Mother Holler. I will show you the way. Now for the golden shower, thought Ellen, as Mother Holler led her to the door. But when she passed through, a pot of black dye tumbled down upon her. That is all you have earned, said old Mother Holler as she turned back into the cottage. And when Ellen reached home, instead of an apron full of gold to show, she had only her dirty clothes. End of section 19 Section 20 of Favourite Fairy Tales Retold This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Favorite Fairy Tales Retold by Julia Darrow Cowles Eric No Luck, A Russian Folk Tale Once upon a time there was a hunter named Eric, who went day after day into the woods in search of game, but no game did he bag. And this happened so often that at last he came by his friends to be called Eric No Luck. One day, when, as usual, he was roaming the woods, he sat down to rest at the mouth of a cave where the air was cool. And as he thus sat, thinking of his ill luck and his poverty, he heard a tiny voice, which seemed to come from far, far back in the cave. "'Help me! Help me!' cried the voice, but it was such a tiny voice that it sounded like the chirp of a bird. Eric's curiosity was aroused, and as he was a bold man and fond of adventure, he entered the cave and looked about. It was dark in the cave. The air was heavy, and the bottom was covered with stones and slime. "'Be careful!' cried the tiny voice again, as Eric advanced. "'Mind where you step, or you may go a thousand feet down to the bottom of this cavern.' "'Who are you?' called Eric. "'And where are you?' "'I am here in this jar,' called the tiny voice. "'I was shut in the jar seventy years ago by a wicked magician.' and no one has come to the cave since. Oh, do let me out! 
I will repay you well if you will. So Eric Nolak picked his way carefully over the stones till he was far, far back in the cave. Then he saw a soft glow of light, and upon reaching it found that the glow came from a metal jar, and the cover of the jar was securely fastened by a heavy seal. Again the voice cried, I am here, here in the jar. Just break the seal and out I come, then I will repay you. But how am I to know that you will repay me? asked Eric. Try me, try me, said the tiny voice. I believe I will, answered Eric, and with that he broke the seal, lifted the cover of the jar, and looked in. But not a thing did he see. Where are you? cried Eric. Are you fooling me? No, said the voice, close beside Eric's ear. I'm right here, but no man can see me, for to mortals I am invisible. But for three days you may ask of me whatever you will, and you shall have your wish. When you need me, call Mirza, and say these words. Go where thou wilt, and bring what thou wilt. So Eric made his way out of the cave, and once more took up the bow and arrows he had left at the entrance. I wish I might find a deer in the forest, he said. And then he thought, why not try my little friend at the trick? So he called, Mirza. Go where thou wilt, and bring what thou wilt. Hardly had he finished when he heard a crackling of branches, and a fine young deer stood under the trees before him. Swiftly he sped an arrow, and the deer dropped. Aha! cried Eric Nolak. Wait till I show this to my friends. He started to carry the deer home, but he had not gone far when he met a gypsy leading a fine horse, and the gypsy offered the horse for sale. I wish I had the money to buy it, said Eric No Luck. Then I could carry the deer home in fine style. Then again he thought of his invisible friend. Murza, he cried, go where thou wilt, and bring what thou wilt. In a moment he felt something hard in his pocket, and thrusting in his hand he drew out a fistful of gold pieces. With these he paid for the horse, and throwing the deer across its back he mounted and rode toward home like a nobleman. But before he had cleared the wood, he heard horses behind him, and turning, he faced a whole band of robbers who had learned from the gypsy of the gold he was carrying. Murza, he quickly called, go where thou wilt, and bring what thou wilt. He had hardly finished speaking, when there was a noise of galloping and shouting, as though a large party of mounted men were coming that way, and when they heard it, the robbers turned their horses and dashed off as fast as they could go. Thanks, good Murza, said Eric Nolak. Thou art truly keeping thy promise. As Eric rode on, he was presently joined by a youth, who rode as fine a horse as his own, and who was dressed like a knight. He had a mantle thrown over his shoulders, and a plume in his hat, and a sword hung by his side. You have a fine horse, said the youth. If twere not for your deer, I would think you were on your way to join the Tsar's regiment. And what is the regiment to do? asked Eric Nolak. Have you not heard? asked the youth. A large band of robbers is in the woods, and they threaten to attack the palace itself. They are dangerous men, and well armed, and they must be driven from the country. And does the Tsar need a regiment to disperse these robbers? asked Eric Nolak, thinking of his own recent encounter. Indeed, you would think so if you had heard of the deeds they have done, replied the youth, as he galloped away. Eric rode on home with his deer, and when he reached there he cried, Here, friends, share the deer amongst you. I am going in search of better game. How is this, Eric Nolak? asked the men. But Eric had galloped away while the men stood and gaped in astonishment. Now Eric had heard wonderful stories of the grace and beauty of the princess at the castle, the Tsar's daughter, and in his mind he had formed a plan which he counted upon Mirza to help him carry out. I must be better dressed, he said to himself, before I can present myself to the Tsar. So he called, Mirza, go where thou wilt and bring what you wilt and in a twinkling he was clothed in gold-embroidered garments with plumes in his hat and a jewelled sword by his side. Then he rode gaily on, and soon he came in sight of the Tsar's castle. There were horsemen about, who had come to join the Tsar's regiment, but none was dressed as magnificently as Eric Nolak. He made his way boldly to the castle and asked an audience with the Tsar, and when he was admitted he said, O oh, Tsar, I have come to rid you of the bold robbers who have threatened your castle. Send these men away, I have no need of them. The Tsar was astonished. How can you do this? he asked. I have an invisible friend who will help me, answered Eric, 
and if I succeed I want to marry your daughter. At this the princess began to shed tears, but Eric quickly said, Mirza, go where thou wilt, and bring what thou wilt. And after that the princess's teardrops turned to tiny golden rosebuds, to diamonds and to opals as they fell. Then the princess stopped weeping for very wonder, and began to look favorably upon Eric no luck. And the Tsar said, Very well, try your luck with the robbers. If you succeed you may marry my daughter, but if you fail, off goes your head. The Tsar frowned fearfully as he said this, and Eric trembled a little, for the odds were very great, but he said softly, Mirza, go where thou wilt, and bring what thou wilt. Immediately the castle was surrounded with the most brilliant troop of soldiers ever seen in the land, and at a signal from Eric they dashed away into the woods, and the robbers scattered before them like dust before the wind, and were seen no more in the land. There was a magnificent wedding at the palace when Eric was married to the princess, and all his friends cried, He shall no longer be Eric no luck, but Eric the lucky shall be his name. End of section 20 End of Favorite Fairy Tales Retold by Julia Darrow Cowles